Gentlemen, you'll have your turn. One, one, one of the challenges we should, we should have a vote. focus on I, the I issues that matter. We know the we the business in China. May, Everybody knows that. I, you've got, I honestly, every time I hear you, I feel a little bit dumber for what you say. Well, that was a lot of fun. Uh, and Nikki Haley had it exactly right. Uh, the more I listened to that debate between Republican candidates for the presidency, the dumber I felt because I could not believe I was actually listening to it and watching it. Folks, we have a lot of work to do. We are in a world of hurt. We need to understand exactly what the dynamics are out here in the country right now, because that group of people on that political stage, that debate stage, they're playing to an audience uh, that they think really wants this type of leadership. We know that's not the case, or is it? To help us kind of figure it out as my guest today on the podcast, I'm really excited to have Sarah Longwell. She is the president and CEO of Longwell Partners, president of the Republican Accountability Pact, publisher of The Bulwark, and host of her podcast, The Focus Group Podcast, uh, Sarah is is just good people all around. She brings the conversation to you. It's real. It's live. It's raw. We're going to have all of that coming up next on the Michael Steele podcast. Hey, everybody. Uh, well, look, as, as I said, coming in the front door here uh, today, I am excited as hell about this conversation uh, Sarah is one of the smartest people um, in politics, both on the front side and the back side of it. And I think a chance for her to come and have a conversation with us about what's happening uh, granularly, uh, actually said that without drinking, um, <laughs> is is very, very important. Sarah, welcome to the Michael Steele podcast. Thanks for having me. The, uh, the admiration is completely mutual. Oh, I appreciate that. So, I, I'm going to get into the shit show that was the debate, um, the Republican debate last night. Um, in fact, I had to clean up my my uh, expression of that uh, in the late night hour on MSNBC. I called it a crap show. Mm -hmm. And and I think uh, everyone on set appreciated it. But it was actually a shit show. We'll get into that. What I want to do with you at the beginning, because as I say, you're, you're one of these folks out here that I think a lot of people um kind of overlook uh in terms of the work you're doing they just kind of oh yeah it's just the you know pollster oh it's just a focus group but you particularly when you're coming on like a morning joe or some of the other shows what you're saying to people is okay folks take a time out and listen and pay attention because what's happening is something you need to be aware of and smart about how are you assessing where the country is 13 months out from uh, the upcoming presidential election. And I know it's a long ball game and a lot can happen, but you do get some telltale signs of how people are kind of thinking and looking at things. What's your initial assessment as we set up the play going forward into next fall? Yeah, well, let me just start by saying it is funny to me sometimes when people call me a pollster because that's like not how I think of myself, right? I right. started doing the focus groups because... Uh, I was a I was a very optimistic sort of never Trumper trying to figure out how do we primary Trump? How do we beat this guy? And I I was like, surely Republican voters, the party to which I have devoted my professional life, they cannot like this guy. Uh, and so I was out talking to Larry Hogan and, right. that for, you know, and so then they, people were like, well, you know, is there a chance? We I started listening to voters and I was like, yep, sorry, just ignore me. There is no chance. I have listened to voters now and I, uh, I, I have been mistaken. I've spent too much time at, you know, AEI. And it's like, it's like that. It's like the, it's like the bystander at the scene of an accident telling everybody else, keep moving, nothing to see it. Just keep going. It's yeah, bad. Yeah. Keep going. It was, I was like, Oh no, it's, it's worse than we, it's worse than you think. Um, and, and it, you know, actually the, what what I find so grounding about the focus groups and the reason now I do them every week. And I, so I don't do them like for a candidate or for this right. or that. I listen every week to voters across the political spectrum, both to help set my own strategy. Cause I continue to want to defend democracy in whatever way we can. And that is probably going to meet, be trying to beat Donald Trump again in 2024. Um, 
but I also don't want to engage in fantasy politics. You know, I don't want to get pulled down rabbit holes, uh, like no labels or something like that. Right. right. Cause I live in Washington DC and get sort of, uh, get infected by the thinking here. And so if you listen to real voters, you do have a pretty clear sense or it just gives you, it keeps you much more grounded about like what is possible. And so, you know, for example, right now, um, there's a lot of, uh, bedwetting, uh, mm-hmm. over Joe Biden, um, in, in all political circles. And like, for good reason. I mean, but I I wet my bed about it. Like my sheets were soaked uh, like a year ago because I was listening to Democrats. I was listening to swing voters and they were already he's too old. He shouldn't run again. Um, and so, like, I flagged that a while back and thought and like now I think it's too late. Like, uh, yeah. but yeah. personally, uh, but the, the voters are I was just I was actually in physically with PBS. Uh, we went to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania and talked to Democrats and you know they don't want him to be the nominee. That is just oh, so. What are they? What are they going to do? What are, they're not Joe Biden. I mean, is there's no internal pressure to push Joe Biden now? I, I just don't get this about Democrats right now. Yeah, I, honest to God, don't get the thing in front of you is the most god awful thing on the friggin' planet, and you're sitting here telling me you're worried about a guy who's eighty years old who is who is who is out on the, around the globe doing d- transacting business on behalf of the country standing on a union picket line uh in the middle of the afternoon and you're telling me he's too old to do the job that's your that's the basis on which you're uh, prepared to overthrow the entire system where do you, they think this goes so this is this is and, part and of I'm what, sorry sir I don't know you sound yeah. just like JBL my partner on the other one he this is him he just like loses his mind when I tell him about voters uh and I'm sorry I am I am I hate to be the bearer of bad news and I'm I'm gonna bear bad news across the political spectrum so just I will do Democrats first here though here's the thing when you go though to these voters and you say um so like when I was in Bethlehem there's a couple of voters as a young black woman and then there was another there's a young white woman both of whom had talked about uh the police and crime and shootings right. is something they felt like wasn't getting better. The other one was talking about the economy and how high rent was. They both kind of expressed that they might sit it out. But then when you said, OK, well, what if it's Joe Biden versus Donald Trump? They were like, oh, no, no, then I'm going to come vote against Donald Trump. But this is actually the key thing I want to emphasize, which is when you say what's wrong with these these voters, they're still well, the reason when they say they don't want Joe Biden to be the nominee, they th- still think that's a possibility because they have not caught up yet to where we are in the cycle. They're not really paying attention. Okay. They're not. Okay. And so, like, when you tell them it's going to be Joe Biden yeah. and Donald Trump, that actually surprises a lot of these voters. They're like, oh, so, okay. like, they're not following it closely enough to be like, oh, Donald Trump is definitely going to be the Republican nominee. Joe Biden's definitely going to be our nominee. And like, this is what we're looking at. Like, they right. they still are in a world of. Oh, is well, maybe somebody else. But the other thing that's funny about the Democratic voters, though, to your point is like, well, what do you think they think the alternative is when you say, uh, well, what do you guys think of Gretchen Whitmer? Like half the group's like, who's Gretchen Whitmer? Uh, or, you know, like, what do you think of I Gavin Newsom? Like two people know who Gavin Newsom is. They all knew who Josh Shapiro was and they liked him very much, but they don't they're not interested in him, like replacing Biden right now. Like, that's not right. a thing they think about. So a lot of the D.C. parlor game of like, but what about sort of Warnock? Whitmer. And I I just want to tell you guys, no voters know who these people are. And like the, unless they live in their state, they don't know who these people are. And like the idea that they are going to get a national campaign up and running and like appeal to all of these voters in the next like six, seven months, it's just not going to happen. And that's what I mean about fantasy politics. Like you have to be able to look at these groups, hear what they're saying and be like, yes, the reason Joe Biden's poll numbers are lagging is because there's not a lot of enthusiasm for him. There is still though, like nobody wants Donald Trump, the, the, and, and that's the, the Donald Trump, the swing voters, let's just go to swing voters for a second. There's a lot of them that are really frustrated with the economy. They're down on the economy. Um, but still head to head, if you do Trump and Biden, uh, they like they're backsliding a little bit toward Trump. But the second that they get like really reminded when Trump's back in their face, they will remember why they hate Donald right, Trump, right. Um, because they if you get them rolling on Trump, they're like, oh, yeah, he sucked. Um, <laughs> and like, that's why I voted for Biden. And so uh, and I'll tell you, though, this is where the no labels danger really comes in, because the people we just did a, a group yesterday and it was swing voters, people who voted for Trump in 16, Biden in 20. And we were like, uh, 
head to head, Trump Biden, it went eight Biden, one Trump. You throw in no labels, they're a third party candidacy. Suddenly, uh, it was three Biden, uh, nobody for Trump, five uh, for, or no, maybe it's three Biden, one Trump, five for no labels. So he took five, it took like five away from Joe Biden. Of course. Um, And that's, that's the problem. That's it takes from Biden. And it does take, and I don't understand the lie that they're perpetuating that it that it won't. And and, and I asked Nancy, and I've asked Larry Hogan, I've asked Nancy Jacobson, Larry Hogan, um, anyone associated with no labels. Uh, tell me the state you win. Tell me where. Tell me what electoral vote you take um and put in your column in what state does that happen is it do you get maryland's 10 electoral votes do you get california's 52 electoral votes? where do you get your votes from and they can't tell you that because there are no votes there are no we don't have a we don't elect the president yet by popular vote i'm working on that with the national popular vote but we don't do that what we do is elect them through the electoral college process as it currently is which means you've got about four battleground states in which this election is going to be determined. And they are Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Nevada. And you, and, and then you can throw in Georgia uh, Arizona. And, and Arizona with a little yeah. bit of cream on top, right? So which one of those does do you take and put in your column? And they don't. And I don't understand how, and that, that to me, to your earlier point kind of confuses the narrative and voters just kind of go and they just check out they're just they're like okay i'll, I'll look at this later <laughs> yeah that's right and it it also i mean there's a whole bunch wrong with what no labels is doing it's creating a weird false equivalency between trump and joe biden i've seen no labels claim that they're going to win delaware like as one of their states and i'm like well that's asinine like the idea that joe biden's not going to win his home state is just it's pure fiction um, and and this is who this is who know the, my but the point is is that like to beat Donald Trump you don't really have a pro Joe Biden coalition as much as you have an anti Trump coalition right and you need to keep that anti Trump coalition together and a no labels ticket splits the anti Trump coalition right. and it pulls off the critical five six percent that we were able to persuade in twenty twenty uh, and basically like takes them out and Joe Biden needs them to hold off this menace of this current version of the Republican Party. Uh, which I'll just talk about for one second. I mean, listening, I do a lot of two-time Trump voter groups. Um, There was a moment 11 months ago or so when there was kind of a chunk of the party that really wanted to move on from Donald Trump, primarily for electability reasons. I remember you saying saying that, yep. Mm -hmm. And and DeSantis was the guy, a lot of DeSantis curious voters. And then the race started, Donald Trump started attacking him, DeSantis started being more visible, and it just cratered. I mean, you just, yeah. I, so tell me if I'm wrong on this. I mean, so uh, my my take on the whole DeSantis thing, and, and I, I would tell, you know, some of the Republicans here in town this, and certainly Democrats, is that you need to understand, for, at least as I saw it, having been as tied to the base of this party as I've been for over 40 years, that Ron DeSantis was not a creature of the base. He was a creature of the money interest in the party. They're the ones who pushed him out there. They're the ones who were floated his boat. It wasn't this organic push up by the base saying, oh, we want this guy over Trump. Now, once he was there, to your point, some were kind of, you know, by curious, if you will, just kind of looking looking both ways and seeing which one made them feel all yummy inside. But at the end of the day, as you again noted from your experience on the ground, when the game was afoot, what happened? The base went, oh, hell no, this ain't Trump. No, we don't know. This, is, this guy, no, this guy is just a nice suit. And that means he's like Washington. And and all the stuff that he was doing, you know, claiming in Florida that he was doing, the reason if he were doing that during his re-election campaign, he wouldn't have. If he was promoting, you know, six weeks abortion and uh, <laughs> in you know during the, his run for governor, he wouldn't have gotten elected, re-elected. He knew that, and the base knew that. So they they saw the the falseness of him. 
um, and they saw the money interest sort of puppet strings on it, and they just walked away, and they stayed with Trump, and no one else has claimed that space. That's my take. That's a completely right take. I mean, I knew DeSantis was starting to really that it was kind of be, it was kind of over with him with voters when I started hearing them say he's kind of establishment uh, because <laughs> yes. that's like the kiss of death. Yes, um, and also like he seems like a regular politician. I mean, a regular politician is voters being like. Because that's why, like, that's what they love about Trump. They'll say he's not a regular politician. Right, right. And so you could just hear it. And, you know, their relationship with Trump ran so deep. Uh, and their relationship with DeSantis was pretty shallow, right? They yeah. hadn't seen that much of him. And once they started, they, they they saw him shouting at some reporters on TV. And they were like, I like that guy. And he seems like Trump without the baggage. And people were worried after 2022 that Trump had maybe an electability problem. But here's the thing. DeSantis is both a bad candidate, like, human-wise, but he also oh. had the wrong strategy, yes. uh, right? Like, his idea of, hey, there's an available chunk of voters over here that do want to move on from Trump. I'm going to try to consolidate them and then work on other people. And he was like, no, 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 here's what I should do. I'm going to wrestle Trump for his death cult that is never going to leave him by trying to out Trump Trump, which is insane. Uh, and undermined the one argument that he had, which was yeah. an electability argument, because That's now it. he people think Trump's more electable than he is. And they're yep. probably right. Yep. Your absolutely. Point. Absolutely. So you have you have um, the Democratic. So I, I'm going to finish the point because I want to get a little bit more on the Republican side. And then we're going to take a, a quick break and come back and talk about the shit show known as the debates. So you had, to sum up on the Dems, what from what you've seen out there and how are you looking at the landscape, what would be some of the advice you would give them to navigate um, with these voters to, to begin to pull their attention towards the success of the economy, the success in foreign policy, the success in infrastructure, the success in abating inflation uh, and, and um, um, uh, high interest rates um, as best that they can. How, how, how would, you, would you advise them at this point to, to take their head out of their ass, look at what America is telling them they're concerned about and addressing that? Yeah, so... Uh, here's, uh, this has been my advice all along. So one of the things that I keep trying to explain to Democrats, because Democrats are like, but here's the good news. And we passed the infrastructure bill and here's what was in it. And let me tell you why this is so great. And I'm like, let me tell you, your voters on your side don't know any about this. Swing voters don't know, like nobody knows about any of this. And they're like, but we're running ads. And so my big uh, frustration with the Democrats' communications capabilities is like, look, you guys know Joe Biden's not going to be your lead communicator. It's not what he's good at. Why don't you have an army of surrogates out there telling this story? Uh, yes. when, when Donald Trump yes. was doing this, like Donald Trump would go out and be like, best economy for black people, best economy for women, best economy for you, you, how's your 401k? And then every other Republican would say like the exact same thing. We moved this to Israel, you know what? And everybody was singing from the same song sheet. Joe Biden does not have that chorus. And you know what? I do not care at all for Gavin Newsom. He's not my cup of tea among the right. Democrats, but he is the only, only one, one who only is one. out there. Yep. He's mixing it up with, you know, the Fox News host. He's he's getting into yep. debates. He's defending Biden's record. And there should be a hundred other people doing that too. This is, I, I'm like, this is part of the, too, my frustration with the, but somebody else would be so much better. I'm like, I have not seen Warnock or Whitmer. No. Like, they're not out there no. defending this, making the case, becoming high profile surrogates. They should. They need to. And so I, uh, I, I've never understood that. So that is my advice: is like everyone needs to warm up their voices and get out there and become part of the chorus to help Joe Biden out. He's the idea that everyone just sits around criticizing Biden for being old. Like, fine, show them all the young faces of the party. Show them who's around them. Paint a different picture. They can all, they all control that. Show those young faces supporting Joe Biden. Because right. that negates this whole, oh, my God, he's so old. Because you, you're saying, yeah, he is. But he's Uncle Joe. He's Grandpa Joe. And so he's still viable. He's still important to what we need to do. And, and as long as he is, I'm behind him. I'm supporting him. He's done these things that no one else in the Democratic Party has done since Johnson, since Lyndon Johnson. And regardless of whether you like it from a policy standpoint or not, Democrats have been successful because Joe Biden was successful at doing what Joe Biden does. I mean, I go back and I, I remember just telling just a group of Democrats at a dinner, dude, 
He negotiated Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security off the debt limit table, right? When we were talking about the debt limit, he stood in the well of the Congress, looked those Republicans in the eye and said, oh, so you guys agree with me. We're not going to touch Medicare, Social Security, and, and Medicaid. And they stood up and applauded. Yo, no, we're not doing it. He was like, okay, we're, we're good. I forgot I, about that I, moment. That was here. a good moment. That was a great moment. And these idiots didn't even know how to talk about the moment that he just given him and run with that to begin to your earlier point, grind down the narrative that Joe Biden, A, is too old and B, has accomplished nothing. Yeah, uh, I I totally. And it's actually quite annoying uh, to see people like Brian Kemp and other Republicans like they're all standing behind Donald Trump try to coup. Like he did, he like presided over a million people dying of COVID and every Republican's like, oh yeah, I'll still vote for him. Oh yeah, I'll support him if he's the nominee. Joe Biden did none of those bad things, did some pretty good things. And you'd think that Democrats would be like rallying to his defense. Instead, they all sit around like, you know, twi- twi- twisting their arms and letting and giving their 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 voters permission to do the same, right? Like right. I'm I'm telling you what I'm hearing from voters but like you, I don't think they realized they could have some control over that narrative if they went out there and really uh, did the job. So let's let's shift uh, to uh, the other side of the aisle and the Republican base, which you've touched on a little bit. Um, what what I'm curious about now that you sort of laid out, okay, this is where this base is is leaning. So they they've kind of locked in on Trump. How does that still and, and and why has it still seemingly kept the Republican leadership from um, really kind of pushing back on that and pulling at that in a way that says, we can't win with this strategy? Um, the I mean, it's almost the opposite problem that the Democrats have. They're out there thinking they can't win with success Republicans are like, we can't win with failure. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm like, what, 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 is, what is the narrative inside the GOP right now, particularly with the political leadership, given that the RNC, Kevin McCarthy and his speakership all seem to be uh, beholden and, and really held captive by a base that is looking at something that's just, just really otherly earth too. Yeah, I mean- as best I can tell, what happened is that uh, the Republicans were sure after January 6th, right, that that the Trump thing was over, that the fever had broken. And so they didn't impeach him. And they basically set the stage for all of this now to happen. They right. have at every point hoped for like a cheeseburger or some other exogenous event to come and take Trump out that they don't have to put their hands on and be active right. participants in. And so there's this major collective action problem. Uh, and it's funny, Trump tipped, there was like this phase, right, where they were all like, Trump can't win. He won't be the nominee. You've got, uh, right. what's his name from New Hampshire, you know, when he decided oh, not Sununu? to run. Sununu yes. was like, but he can't win. And Larry, he, they, they all, Paul Ryan, I, he, well, he yeah. can't win. Relax, he yeah. relax. This he won't be, be the fine. nominee. He won't be the nominee. And so everybody's kind of like, okay, well, we won't be. The, but here's the thing. You cannot beat something with nothing. Right. And then you look at these field of candidates that are running. They all decided not to attack Trump. They all became bit players in the central drama surrounding Trump because they were all defending him for every indictment that came down. And it's like at some point without noticing, it went from, well, Trump can't win. He can't be the nominee to, well, Trump's definitely the nominee. Now we can't do anything about it. Right. And like, I don't know where that middle part was where they all thought there was an opening, but I, I missed it. They missed it. And now I think they're already back to talking themselves into accepting Trump again. And they're saying, telling themselves things like, well- he can only do one more term. So like, we'll just suck it up for another four <laughs> oh years. God. And it's like, I don't know, guys, you may have met the guy. He might not go anywhere. Like <laughs> he he's going to be president till you're dead. Cause... Right. <laughs> and we are so effed. And the thing that I find that, that's, that's striking, um, and I'd be very curious what you're finding here, because the parallel that's beginning to emerge on the Democratic side with Senator Bob Menendez um, is very intriguing for me. The idea that you have a, a putative nominee for the Republican Party who is engulfed. I mean, you you could not you could not put more gasoline on oneself and light it 
to be more engulfed than Donald Trump is in the fires of litigation around his behavior and the actions that he uh, took and didn't take um, on January 6th that he took and didn't take um, in his, uh, you know, phone call with Raffensperger in Georgia, et cetera. And yet the party is like, it's my man. That's my man. I'm going, I'm ride or die. You know, yeah. six out of eight candidates on that stage in the first debate raised their hand and said, yes, if the man is wearing an orange jumpsuit suit with shackles on his legs, I will support him. I will endorse him. And then you have on the other side, Democrats very quickly coming out. I think some, you know, half of the Democrats in the leadership in the, in the Senate um, and governors uh, around the country saying, Bob Menendez, nah, we're not carrying this water into this election cycle. You need to stand down. Talk a little bit about that contrast in, in the approach and whether or not public the public really appreciates it and also what it is about the republicans that they they're walking around with a gob of shit on the bottom of their shoe and they refuse to find a curb that they could scrape it all off against yeah i mean look first of all uh yeah there's been a total asymmetry in the way that democrats have handled their sort of scandals uh, of the last. And that includes, uh, you know, when Me Too was hot, uh, mm -hmm. they got rid of Franken rather than they didn't defend him. Um, and they didn't get much credit for that. And in fact, I think a lot of Democrats look at that and they were like, I wish we hadn't done that. Yeah, they do. Um, yeah. And because that cost us like a real person in the party. Uh, <laughs> but I think with Menendez, like they know right now, whether it's Hunter Biden or Bob Menendez, that they want to do everything they can to 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 present a different picture from Republicans and say that um, corruption is unacceptable. And I think that's both right politically as well as correct morally. Right. Uh, the party should not accept corruption yeah. within their ranks. And frankly, the only the party should be doing is holding people accountable. Now, the Republicans uh, basically learned from Donald Trump that uh, by not apologizing and uh, refusing to hold anybody accountable. I mean, at this point, is there something that could get a Republican fired? Is there something that could get a Republican? I mean, George Santos isn't losing anything. Lauren right. Boebert didn't lose anything. Marjorie Taylor. I mean, it, you could speak at a white supremacist conference, you know, you could be Paul Gosar. Or get felt up in, a, in, a, in, a, in an audience somewhere in public. Yeah. Yeah. You can do whatever. Um, and and no one, you can lie about everything, have a million investigations against you. That could be Trump. That could be Santos, whatever. Uh, no one's going to hold you accountable on the right. And so the fact that there is one political party that still is showing any uh, sense around accountability, I think, is is important because Democrats have to, I think, demonstrate that they are the party for serious people, right? That right. they they can be the big, broad pro democracy coalition for people who say like actually some of this stuff still matters. So I think that's good. The question about whether though how much credit they'll get from voters for it. That's a tough one. Um, I wish voters gave people more credit for doing the right thing. Um, Donald yeah. Trump's had a heck of a normalizing impact on voters of all kinds for just having a much higher threshold for the nonsense and just like all of it being a circus and people not caring as much. Um, so do I don't know. So I, I still think they need to do it. Do like, you think something serious has to happen to your last point that people begin to realize, oh, man. I really screwed us up. I got this all wrong. I can't believe that now, you know, my my freedoms have been curtailed or because you're right. If Donald Trump gets back in and he's already told I'm your retribution. So that means a lot of people are going to get going to. I mean, he's already said he wants to kill the, the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, Milley, General Milley, that he would take him out and have him shot. Um, and I suspect that there's some people in the military who would do that. Uh, and we need to be honest about that too. Uh, and there's just a lot, my point being, there's just a lot of poison in the system now that quote, good people that you think would do the right thing uh, and be there like they were in a first Trump term in a second Trump term. I don't think that goodness is going to be there. I don't think that, that, that interest in the national, um, uh, you know, democratic experiment is going to be there. I think it will be about how do I help Donald Trump repay the wrongs that have been, um, uh, you know, used against him or the wrongs that he's endured. Um, and 
at that point, do people go, oh, so that's what you've been trying to tell me for the last 10 years. So I don't know about that. Uh, I don't know that there's like, that's like a fever breaking moment that I'm not sure quite happens. Here's what I do think happens, or here's how I think we have to think about politics in general. And this is really what the voters have taught me, um, which is that we are going to, our democracy is going to live or die in very small margins in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Georgia, Arizona, uh, mm -hmm. Michigan. And like Al Pacino and every given Sunday talking about the six inches we got right, right. like we are going to have to scratch and claw for these margins um and it's going to require both uh turnout from voters who are extremely alarmed uh by Trump it's going to require persuasion of sort of right-leaning independents and soft GOP voters who look really at things like like there are Republican voters who voted for Trump twice who after January 6th were like I'm out and mm -hmm. you got to remind them about January 6th. You got to remind them how they felt about that. Um, and I think you've got to show them like, hey, guys, Mike Flynn's going to run the Defense Department. Right. Uh, and the guy, Eastman, who tried to overturn the last election, he'll run DOJ. Like, and uh, it's going to get really scary. And, uh, and, and I don't just mean that as like a thing you tell people, like, that's what I think is going to happen. I think it is a terrifying scenario in right. which Donald Trump wins again. And I think... Um, you know, we all need to be thinking now about how we uh, pull pull small numbers from these like women, college educated suburban women who I think are going to be uh, they're going to feel differently now on some of the abortion questions. That's going to be more motivating. And I think we can reach them on some of that. And it's going to take here. And, you know, for us, we think about permission structures all the time and the way that we do our advertising work. And right. so we're going to go find these two time Trump voters to talk about why they think Trump's unfit. We're going to have them tell that story. And that's what we're going to try to 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 hit these marginal voters with. And we got to get no labels out of there because those are the voters right. that they're going to appeal to because they are not Democrats. And so, you know, we're in a really dangerous situation. We're facing a really scary time. And that's why it is not the time to screw around with no labels. And it's going to take absolutely everything all of us have to fight for those margins. She is the president and CEO of Longwell Partners. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to do a deep dive into that little cesspool called the debates with Sarah Longwell right after this. Welcome back, everybody, to Michael Steele Podcast. I This has been so much fun, um, and it's so nerdy and so, so <laughs> forward-thinking in so many ways. I love it. Sarah always brings the A game in the conversation around uh, really how voters are thinking and feeling about a lot of stuff out there. Oftentimes, uh, the media just glosses over or just pejoratively kind of puts it all in one bucket. Sarah takes it out the bucket, lays it out very plain, like your mama laying out your clothes in the morning. Here are your underwear, your socks. Here, here's your here are your pants. Here's your shirt. There's your jacket. So you now you put them all in order. You understand what you're going to look like when you're fully dressed. That's what Sarah does with politics. I love it. So Sarah, there was a debate <laughs> and we will call it that because that's what people called it, <laughs> a debate. I, on the other hand, what I watched was an absolute embarrassing um, uh, series of people talking over each other, people uh, lying, uh, people pretending the country is something that it's not, uh, people saying they're going to do shit they know damn well they can't do because it won't be not just the votes in Congress, but the will in the government to accomplish it. What was your just top line off the top view of what the Republicans did at their second national debate without Donald Trump? who, by the way, was claiming he was talking to union workers when, in fact, he was not. <laughs> Again, just lying straight up. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to hang out with you with the union workers out there who support me. And it's like, no, dude, this is a non-union place you're at. So but anyway, what was your top line? Michael, do you remember I, you and I are both we are Republicans. I remember the conservative movement, the Republican Party I joined, I remember thinking like, we are the smart ones. Like, this is where the intellectuals are. This is where yes. thoughtful people are. Yes. I was watching those people on the debate last night and I was like, these are stupid people. <laughs> like, these are stupid people saying yes. stupid things. The only one that's kind of smart is Nikki Haley. And even she, like, got into a screaming match with with Tim Scott about what, curtains? curtains. Like, what was this? What is the curtain scandal that happened in South Carolina that was so important for a national debate stage when Mike Pence talks 
like time stops. Like it's like it slows I down. I and you're responded like, to your tweet on that last night. <laughs> I, I was like, no, I know it, it, it stops on the first breath. <laughs> yeah. You're, and, and it's also like, what is Mike Pence doing there? Mike Pence, have you met a Republican voter? Do you know that if you went to a Donald Trump rally, you'd need armed security to keep yeah. yourself physically safe from being attacked by these base workers? Like Mike Pence, he keeps doing these things where he like he, he delivers a line and he pauses like he's waiting for applause and none ever comes. There's none no comes. applause. Uh it's the and, loneliest conversation on the planet. You know, Vivek <laughs> looks like he's going to the same barber as Matt Gates. It's like all forehead and high hair. What was uh, that? And yeah, and it's like he's it's like and he definitely got coached in between where they were like, look, people thought you were annoying last time. So maybe this time uh, you should acknowledge, you know, that you can be a little intense. And so he did that weird thing where he was like, I might seem a little ambitious and a little, you know, like I was like, what is this guy even talking about? Uh you know, Chris Christie obviously is up there making some sense. He's, but I right. thought that Donald Duck line was kind of didn't land. Yeah, uh, didn't was, see. and he's better when they don't plan it. Yeah, let him he do, is better when they do don't Christie plan it. in the moment. Don't don't give him the contrived Donald Duck line because the Christie I know would have just naturally come to how he owned Marco Rubio. Yeah, that wasn't that was in the moment, and he made it work. But I, I just found it to be. Very, very disconcerting. One of the things that, that struck me was here we are um, in, in very important ground for Republicans like you and me, Reagan's library, um, and knowing what Reagan's uh, history uh, and accomplishment were, accomplishments were on the economy, his accomplishments in, in um, uh, the global sphere, taking on Russia, and knowing that some of these idiots on this stage were actually, uh, you know, Putin puppets, um, to me was offensive. But beyond all of those things, the country got nothing out of that conversation. Um, Donald Trump has no incentive to show up at any of these. He's already announced I'm not going to the next one. In fact, he might as well just say I'm not going to any of them until I'm standing on stage against Joe Biden. And even then, I don't know if he'll do that. But the reality of it is, what, what is the significance of last night relative to um, how this ultimately ends? Because Donald Trump will be the nominee. I've said it from the beginning. I still hold true to that. But what happens to these people? Is, is this just auditioning for cabinet positions? Donald Trump even said last night, I looked at that state, none of them going to be my VP. But we yeah. knew that. We knew that already. I don't know. I've always kind of thought Tim Scott had kind of a shot at Trump's VP. Tim, Donald right. Trump is not putting a black man on the ticket with him because he don't like black people. So he's not mm -hmm. putting a black man on this on the ticket, number one. And so let's let's call that what it is. That that shit ain't happening. Well, so, I don't think he likes women either. And I think he doesn't like a, he doesn't like he, he doesn't like women, but he's politically savvy enough to know that he gets one that he doesn't have to necessarily deal with on a day in and day. That's why Nikki Haley wouldn't be on the ticket. Yeah. No, Nikki now, Haley. Uh, you know, a, a, I don't know. Uh, the what's so Carrie Lake. No. Oh, Car Car oh, Carrie Lake. Carrie Lake. Yeah. But Carrie Lake shows too much of her own ambition. Oh, you mean like Elise Stefanik? Elise Stefanik. Yeah. That's, that's my choice for his number two. I think that's a good solid choice. I think that's because I, I think there's a there's a case to be made for sort of the Carrie Lake, Marjorie Taylor Greene contingent because they do the like Donald Trump is God. But right. he also has to know like they're looking for their own limelight too. That's right. Whereas Elise Stefanik has shown that she will be a perfectly surf serviceable sort of supplicant to whatever he wants. That's right. Uh, that's right. To do, which absolutely is a disaster. She used to be somebody that I really looked up to. I know. I would have modeled here. my own political career after, uh, but certainly not now um, and not in this party. Uh, so, uh, yeah, no, I, I agree. I think some of them are. Look, Vivek is clearly running to raise his profile and Tim Scott and Nikki Haley, um, I think, uh, probably have VP ambitions, but now probably now that they're being told, no, maybe it is cabinet positions. Look, I think uh, Mike Pence just literally doesn't know what's going on with the party. Like he thinks God yeah. wants him to be there. And I think he's being, I think he's being punished yeah. for uh, the yeah. last go around. Um, exactly. You know, Chris Christie's got something to say, uh, but he's not going to be like, 
this is it's not even an undercard debate. Uh, like all they did was embarrass themselves. Um, I think the only person who's benefited, we haven't even talked about Ron DeSantis. Like Ron DeSantis has done absolutely everything he can to make sure he stays exactly 30 points behind Donald Trump. Uh, and that's why I haven't talked about him. Because yeah, that's right. There, that's there's right. no there's no need to there at this point, I don't think. But here's the only thing that I thought mattered, which is that I think that the donor community and sort of the like national review types are wishing that they'd backed Haley from the beginning yes, instead of being are. all in on DeSantis. I've heard That's it. the only thing. I've yeah. heard it. Yeah. I've heard it. It's like, oh, I didn't know. I was like, well, I, the Nikki Haley at that in these first two debates are the, is the Nikki Haley that I got behind and helped get elected uh, governor in 2010. Um the Nikki Haley who took down the Confederate flag um, did that side, you know, that side road trip with Trump and, you know, tried to get off off those tracks um, and has been somewhat successful at it. But then again, still steers in that direction. So she is in this sort of space where she's still, you know, she's got the wheel. She just doesn't know <laughs> exactly where she wants to steer it completely. But I agree with you. Um I think a lot of those donor types are sitting there going, hmm, how did we miss that? Well, you missed it because certain cultures within the party pumped up and pushed out Ron DeSantis because he was the successful newly elected, reelected governor of Florida. Florida was an important state. No, it ain't. Florida's red. We got that in our column. So how does he help you win Wisconsin or Michigan? Um, particularly when he's doing what he's doing in Florida. So that's kind of their challenge, I think, in many respects. But I would agree with you. Uh, one thing before I let you go, because I know you're on a tight schedule and I just appreciate your time. Uh, government shutdown, the politics of that. Uh, we're, we're just for the for folks to know, we're doing this before Saturday. Um, so we don't know exactly what's going to happen um, by the time you, you know, this, uh, this is aired and, and repeated, but what's your take on the government shutdown, uh, politics for both Democrats and Republicans, um, as we head into shutdown weekend? Oh, this is so bad. And I don't know the answer. Cause I actually don't really see McCarthy's path out. Like this is such a weird either. one. Cause it's yeah. both like, I don't see McCarthy's path out, but also again, saying you can't beat something with nothing the chaos caucus like doesn't have an alternative and so it seems like the only way something gets resolved is like some of the moderates side with the democrats to do something but like do the democrats have an incentive to bail mccarthy out on this i'm not sure you know like uh because the De the republicans have done a bang up job of making sure everyone knows this is on them they're the ones doing this uh I've always said, though, I'm always a little nervous around things like this because I do think what happens is, is voters don't pay attention. They're not reading Punchbowl. They're not reading Politico. So they just like look up when like the park's not open suddenly, like the zoo's not open or their people aren't getting paychecks. And they're like, OK, who do I blame for this? And, you know, when you're the president, sometimes people look, they don't like to see people presiding over chaos. And so I do think it's in Democrats interest somewhat just for like human reasons to get this thing wrapped up. But the Republicans are going to make this impossible. They yeah. are just a bunch what a clown car what an yeah. unserious bunch of folks it really it really is and it's unfortunate and a lot of a lot of families across the country uh could be severely hurt um because you know people live at the margins and um uh, one paycheck that doesn't come in it throws the family for a loop and it and it makes it much harder and it again uh I don't know. It just says a lot about the the nature of our leadership right now in the country. And I, I really, I, I talk about it a lot. Folks really focus on the men and women that you elect to represent your interest. Um, we can't afford people to go to Washington and do what we see Republicans doing right now. Um, this isn't about, oh, well, I'm a Republican, always have been, therefore I'll re vote a Republican. Yeah, but that if that Republican is bad for your interest, why do it? You know, it doesn't make find a better Republican. <laughs> there are they are out there. Sarah talks to some of them. Find find better Republicans to put out there. Sarah Longwell, she is um, amazing at what she does. I really appreciate it. Uh, she is the president of Republican Accountability uh, Pack, publisher of the Bulwark, host of the Focus Group podcast. 
um, and just all around good people. She just, I uh, just love it uh, when you do what you do and you do it so well and I love sharing it with folks. Um, follow her on Twitter and with the new one. Are you on uh, threads? I haven't, I can't, I mean, I guess I'm on it, but I don't even remember my thing. I like can't break my Twitter habit. If, if Musk starts charging us, maybe I'll be gone. But yeah, right uh, now... when the moment the bill comes, I'm out. I'm just totally, because I've just watched it just sort of go down, but you're on Twitter at Sarah Longwell 25, follow her there, follow her work uh, at the bulwark as well. Um, good, a good group, group of reporters and journalists uh, and opinion writers uh, there, podcasters as well. So Sarah, thanks so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. Uh, thanks so much for having me. I love seeing your face. Uh, same here, same here. That does it for this time together, folks. Uh, don't forget to do the download thing because you know it makes me feel all yummy inside. I really appreciate it. Follow us certainly on Twitter at Michael Steele, the podcast at Steele underscore podcast. Until next time, be safe, be well, take care. It's getting a little bit chilly out there. So Guess we're getting close to fall. I love it. My time of year. Till next time.